So welcome to everyone. And, and we acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of all these lands. Um, please note, as you've heard, that the event is being recorded and it will be posted on the website of the uh, Emeritus College and you'll receive a link to it uh, after it has been posted. Um, so by virtue of you being here, you're aware that the conversation today is meant to be on the use, misuse, distrust, meaning and utility of models in publicly important science. Um, Probably we don't think about it often enough, but, but models drive much of what we see and do almost every day. And models are, uh, are vitally important to science. In fact, it, it can be argued that all of science is, is, is brought forward by the use and interpretation and elaboration of models. And today we're gonna to be hearing from speakers in regard to the use of uh, models in climate science, epidem uh, epidemics, uh, air quality and the impact of these models in, in publicly important ways and the issues and, and difficulties that the public may have in interpreting and understanding the role of models in science. And so to do so, we have three wonderful speakers today, uh, one of whom is, um, is Doe Stain, another is Dan Coombs, another, and the other is Jim Zidek, who you've read um, much about by now. And rather than do an introduction uh, to each of them, what I'm going to do is start us off with a with a question for each of them that will help them uh, indicate to you the the importance of models in their own work and in science in general um, and thereby uh, start off our our conversation so though first to you what do you perceive the role or roles of models to be in science in general and how have you employed models in your own research and to what purpose yeah, you know, it, it is really interesting. The word model in science has been used increasingly over the past four or so decades. Uh, and and in, in its use, we've captured a whole range of quite complicated tools. The, the purpose is twofold of, of a model as I see it. Models are used to provide predictions, uh, quite literally predictions through time but also to provide diagnosis. In other words, to uh, develop an understanding of the underlying processes in whatever the phenomenon is we are modeling. So, you know, when I started off in my career uh, in atmospheric science as a graduate student, my work was quite mixed in terms of observational science in which I took the observations and used observations and then developed models. And it was about 50-50. But through my career, uh, more and more, it has come to be almost entirely the use of models um, in both predictive and uh, diagnostic terms. Um, and it was only later when I started actually teaching a third year undergraduate course on models in science that I came to realize that I, in my youth, had, had used models. You know, I was like all young male kids. I built model airplanes. <laughs> and, and I only realized much later that I had two kinds of model airplanes. The one was the little plastic one in 72 scale models, primarily of Second World War fighter aircraft. And I had them hanging from my ceiling by threads. And they all looked like, you know, the Spitfire, the Hurricane, the Lancaster bomber or whatever. Um, but I also made little uh, Balfourwood models uh, which, which had little elastic bands and plastic propellers and they flew. And I only realized afterwards the really powerful distinction. The plastic models modeled the appearance, the look of the real thing. They were not the real thing. They didn't fly worth a darn, <laughs> but they looked really good scaled down. Whereas the balsa wood models didn't look like any airplane that existed, but they certainly flew very nicely. So this has really helped me understand this realization has helped me understand that models are not the prototype models are not the real thing. They are just abstracts and they capture one or maybe more aspects of the real thing, but can never capture all the aspects. And I guess through my research, particularly, I've spent a large amount of effort in attempting to understand just how much of the model reflects the behavior of the real world and how much is part of the abstraction and should not be trusted and not extended 
uh, you cannot trust the model to be a complete representation, representation of the world. Each model captures some parts and not others. And, and, and my responsibility as a scientist, I think, has been to, to make sure that I understand what part of the real prototype the model captures and what it does not capture, and only to interpret that part which it does capture. So I, I hope that's helped you understand where I come from and, and how I have used models. There's a lot more detail and I'm sure we'll get into it uh, pretty soon once we've heard from Jim and Dan. Wonderful, thanks, Doe. And, um, and I neglected to say at the beginning, so I'd like to do so now that, that, that we, we've all discussed this and decided we'd like to keep this as, as easy going and as informal as possible. We don't want to have a separate question and answer session. We invite you to, to, um, to write your questions in the chat. And as the conversation proceeds, when there are opportunities to bring those questions to the group, we will, we'll try to do so um, and keep this as free flowing and as open as possible and as informal as possible. So feel free to begin writing your questions in whenever you feel ready or something comes to mind. Um, Dan, would you please go ahead with the, basically the same question? Um, how have what what is what do models and science mean to you, and how important have they been in your in your life as a mathematician? Yeah, so um, for people who don't know me, I'm in applied math, and I've been modeling since for for a long time in biological systems, uh, epidemiology, infectious diseases. Um, I wanted to tell you three things that I think about modeling. Um, so in five minutes, I think I have a minute and a half. Um, and the, for each one. And the first thing I wanted to, I'm just gonna share my screen for one second. Um, the first thing I wanted to, to bring up was um, um, ab about uh, simplicity in modeling. Uh, and I kind of doing this sort of as an homage to my, my friend, Fred Brower, who sadly passed away on Sunday. Uh, I think Fred was probably known to a lot of people. He was an emeritus, well, was kind of an emeritus professor at UBC for uh, most of the last 20 years, um, very active until just earlier in the year. And we're all gonna miss his, uh, his sense of humor and his, his wisdom, especially around mathematical modeling of epidemics. Um, but one of the sort of, just to connect something that Fred would always say is that Fred, Fred was a big proponent of simplicity in modeling. Um, and and I, a specific example of this was we, we were talking in the early 2000s when I first came to UBC a lot about uh, network modeling. So if you remember, a lot of people were talking about six degrees of separation, right? So the idea was you would have these networks of individuals that we, we're not just one big cloud of people. We, we actually form social networks. Um, and you can spend a lot of time and you can build quite complex models and statistical physicists really got into this for a while. Um, and Fred would always just listen to this, be very polite, and then you know, quietly comment at the end that, you know, the things that you really cared about, maybe uh, practically, you know, the, the rise and fall of an epidemic, you could get all that information from a much simpler model. And implicit in that is that with your simpler model, you have far fewer things to estimate. You don't have to have all the complexity of, uh, that, that you would need to build sort of a model of everybody doing all of their daily activities and forming that social network, which we know exists, but, you know, a lot of insight can be gained from, from simple models. Anyway, so um, so that was kind of kind of the first thing I wanted to say. The second two are a little more philosophical, perhaps. Um, I, I want to make a statement that if you're if you're doing modeling the right way, then there should be a tension between your model and your data. So you know we're not modeling in a vacuum. You know we have data um, that's coming in. Um, so one of my favorite quotes about modeling is that a good model does not fit all the data because some of the data is wrong. And this is really important that if you believe in your model, then at some point you're gonna run into data that doesn't match your model. And then there are sort of two ways you can go. You can either push your model and say, that's correct. And I don't believe the data and come up with reasons why the data is wrong or, or maybe wrong, but maybe inappropriate to, the, to what it's being used for. But the second, the second thing of course is can turn out your model is wrong. And that's maybe even more interesting. So if you're in a position where you're completely happy with your model and it's matching all the data, well, in my view, you should go and do something else at that point because your job is over, right? And that's, that's no fun. That's not the fun part of the job. The fun part is being wrong and then getting yourself out of that state of wrongness. Um, uh, the, the third thing 
which is a little more general, is, is sort of around aesthetics of modeling. So I'm at a conference right now, and yesterday I went to this lovely talk where this guy was talking about motion of vesicles containing some neurotransmitter into um, these tiny confined spaces in neurons in, in the brain. And, and it had fluid mechanics because there's fluids in here and it had diffusion, it had molecular motors and energy and biophysics and all these pieces and he put them together. And I think everyone in the room was just really engaged with this model because um, it had all these pieces that we sort of understood individually, but no one, I had never seen them put together in that way. And it reminded me a little bit of watching soccer. You know, when you watch soccer, it's kind of, or maybe hockey, it's kind of boring, right? You're seeing these things happening. The guys are passing around and they're in some formation. And then suddenly, you know, Messi gets the ball and something completely unexpected comes and it's the culmination of all this buildup. And you're like, wow, that's what I'm looking for. And I think that's the aesthetic side of modeling. And, I'll poke a little bit and just say, you know, people doing machine learning to try to, to, to get machines to understand things, they're never going to have that moment. You know, the machine's going to come back with something uh, and it's going to fit the data well or something like that. Um, so, so that's maybe a little bit inflammatory in, in today's atmosphere, um, but it's that moment of creation and surprise. And I, I think that sort of transcends a lot of fields uh, of human endeavor, but it's definitely present in modeling as well. Okay, uh, that, that's all, Mark. Thanks. Lovely, thanks, Dan. Um, Jim, Jim, over to you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Oh, there's some uh, points I want to come back to on both Do and uh, and uh, Dan. But uh, let me just say that I trained as a mathematician originally, well, a mathematical statistician, and uh, so it was a beautiful thing. Uh, you could build these models in a mathematical world. And uh, when I graduated with my PhD, I thought I was really an expert on modeling. But I was quite shocked when I uh, got my first big consulting project, which involved the Lionsgate Bridge in Vancouver, which the government of the day was going to tear down and replace at a cost of about $600 million in the money of the day. And uh, the engineering consulting company that uh, hired me from the math department at UBC uh, and recognized that uh, this bridge may not have to come down, that we should really study the bridge by collecting some data. And that's what, that's what happened. Then there was modeling that had to be done in order to understand what the data was telling us about the bridge. And uh, we, in fact, we had a guy who was actually running up and down one of the towers in the month of February to collect uh, video film from a camera that was taking pictures of the cars during accidents so we'd understand an accident in the bridge. And anyway, lo and behold, uh, thanks to a simulation model and also a theoretical model, uh, it turned out we discovered a way of, of saving the bridge by imposing some limits on the traffic. And uh, also uh, at the same time, um, uh, imposing a much more rigid uh, maintenance program on the bridge to make sure that it didn't wear out. So the lessons that came out of this firstly was that although I was, I felt I was a real hotshot uh, with my math training, uh, when I started talking to these engineers, I, they really asked great questions and it made me realize that I had used the model as a sort of gloss for understanding rather than as a way of helping me to understand. And so it was a tremendously good lesson for a, a young uh, researcher. Um, coming back to Do, I, I want to, uh, to add, say uh, uh, what he said again, uh, and that is that uh, sometimes the model is meant to, uh, for you to use to do something, but sometimes the model is just meant to test your knowledge. And so if you put out a model that doesn't work, you may learn a great deal from that uh, fact. Um, and that's kind of picks up on uh, something on that Dan also said in that regard. I thought a classic was the Einstein uh, discovery of relativity in a bus apparently riding around in, uh, in Switzerland. <laughs> or a train. Uh, uh, yeah, or was it a train? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. It was, the, it was the Michelson-Morley experiment that didn't fit. And uh, somehow he, re in, in realizing that the Newtonian model didn't work, he discovered the theory of relativity, which is an outstanding example of that 
that interaction that you have with the model uh, in both directions. And it sometimes can also tell you when the data are wrong, as uh, Doe was saying, and it sometimes uh, the data will tell you where you're wrong. Tricky part is to figure out which, which one it is. And so that brings us to the whole question of uncertainty about models. And that's a really big subject nowadays because all models are wrong. The question is how wrong are they? And uh, especially when you're predicting the future. So I'll stop there. That's great. Doe, no, please. Oh, I, I really would like to, to, to tell a story here that strengthens Dan's point about, and Jim's point about the models being, the data or model being wrong. So the story involves my colleague, Peter Taylor at York University and my ex-student, uh, Keith Ayot, who were working on a wind model, primarily designed to determine wind strength for wind energy studies. And they, were, they, they had a very high resolution, that's spatial resolution model, that could model the wind in great detail. And they were testing it by running their model over a, a very rounded and uniform hill in southern Alberta called Kettles Hill. Um, and they found that, that the, the, the model agreed very closely with the data, excepting at one point around this, the north west side of the hill, as it turned out. And they absolutely could not understand why there was this disagreement over all of the hill except this one sector. Now, in order to make the model run, they had to have what's called a digital elevation model, which is the height of the hill digitized at a mesh of points covering the whole domain. And they had got the data from the standard uh, government surveying data for, for this particular hill. And eventually, in desperation, Peter said, well, something's gone wrong here. And they went back and discovered that there was an error in the survey data. The model, in <laughs> fact, was right, but the data were wrong. They then went back and resurveyed the hill, and lo and behold, it worked beautifully. So, so you know, absolutely, both Dan and Jim are, are totally right on this. This is a, a tremendously complex interaction between data and model. And one of my biggest concerns is that the statistical properties of the model are different than the statistical properties of the data. And far too many of my colleagues compare model output with data as if they are the statistically equivalent item. And I think this is a difficulty. It's a technical difficulty we don't want to get into in this discussion, but it, it simply is one of the really deep problems in using models in science. I also want to, to quote my great colleague, Henk Tenekus, famous Dutch atmospheric scientist, who at one point in his career said something that really echoes Fred Bauer. And that was, we now must be clear what we seek are simple, sophisticated models. Sophisticated in the sense that their assumptions are profound mm -hmm. and capture the essence of the phenomenon we're trying to model. And as a result, if the, if the assumptions are really profound and deep, the models themselves will be simple. Do not necessarily seek complicated models that capture everything that could possibly move. So, sorry, I just wanted <laughs> to strengthen something both Dan and Jim have said from a completely different perspective from both of them. So, so if I could follow that with a question for each of you guys, uh, from the world that I came from in clinical pharmacology, the questions were always, we, we use models a lot. And the questions were, for what purpose? Are we using models to understand causal effects, to explain phenomena in, in, in therapeutics and in biology in general, or simply uh, a simplified model to make good and accurate predictions so that we may know what might happen in future given some inputs or some changes? So in the context of, of your, each of your work, what are the purposes to which you or your colleagues use their models? Is it to explain and understand something about nature or is it to make predictions for a practical purpose in, in either nature or in society? Perhaps, uh, perhaps Dan, you might want to start us off in that regard. <clears throat> yeah, so, so since, the, since the start of the pandemic, right, there's been, there's been an interest in predicting what's going to happen. And it's, I think, you know, it's not, it's not possible to predict what will happen. Okay, I'll, I'll just go out and say that beyond, beyond a pretty short time horizon. So there's, there's a fellow at University of Victoria who's about as good of a predictor of what's going to happen with, you know, the epidemic curves that we're so familiar with. 
um, over the past year and a half. And, you know, he can go out about two weeks or a month. And basically his assumptions are everything's going to kind of keep going the way it's going, whether it's up or down. Um, because, and it turns out that the reason he can do that is because it takes about two weeks usually for public health measures to have any effect, right? So if Bonnie Henry waves her hand at us and something happens, then um, at that point, it takes some time for that to actually work its way into what's going on. Um, but I mean, I can say that, but I can say that because he has a model, right? So he has this very simple model of what's going on. And if you look at what's in there, you realize there's this time scale of about two weeks, which is built up initially, he built it up from um, understandings of, of how virus transmission works and there's an incubation period and all these kinds of things. Um, but now it's kind of empirically justified. And so, so you, you sort of build confidence in, in, your empiric, in your predictions based on a combination of theory and observation, right? Um, yeah, so, so, so I think that's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting point about ability to predict comes from a well-parameterized model. Now, he only built that model so he could predict. That was his purpose from the whole, from the very beginning, right? Other people study epidemic models for different reasons, to understand the effects of things that have already happened, right? So in, in other work, we were looking at the opioid crisis and we were looking at the interventions that the province had put in to help to prevent people from dying of uh, overdoses. And in that case, we, we explicitly decided we really couldn't predict because things were very, very variable. You know, the, the, the amount of fentanyl in the drug supply, according to us, it appears to fluctuate, you know, a lot. And so trying to predict forward in that environment is very difficult to do. I mean, you can make general statements, but what we could do is look backwards, try to infer this hidden, this latent hidden variable of how much of how risky the drug supply was, and then make statements about the value of the interventions that have been put in. So, mm -hmm. so if you can sort of, I guess we were predicting backwards in time in a sense. I, don't know. <laughs> I think that's called backcasting or yeah. Casting. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, what, what about the, Dan? What about the role of government in all of this and uh, the uh, availability of data? Um, mm -hmm. Without mentioning any specific examples, uh, I found that uh, not referring to COVID, but in general, quite difficult, and especially in Canada, uh, of uh, getting uh, the data downloaded. The argument was always that it was uh, going to cost the money. But, uh, you know, to do that, and they didn't have the money. So, but I always was a little skeptical and wondered, uh, you know, if the data might be embarrassing to their, uh, to their bosses, uh, in the case of government scientists. Um, does you anybody... want, you want, yeah, I'll, I'll buy a little bit on that. Among friends here, I'll just say that I think the culture of data sharing, I think it's been made completely apparent that there has to be a change in the, in the culture of how governments handle data and how the public in, you know in the public interest um but there you know there, there is a balancing act between privacy between the cost you know the public health authorities simply didn't have people who were competent to, to post this data in a reliable fashion you know um, and it is embarrassing when they when they measure something and find out that they've had issues with with measurement right yeah um, i think we, as, as the members of the public who comment on this, we could make their lives a little better by not criticizing them so much when they make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> if they'll change their attitude around the data that they might supply. But, yeah. No oh, good. Um, I, question I'd like to stick my neck in here because, you know, as an atmospheric scientist, I, I must point out that we are all of our lives embedded in the products of models, and those are weather forecast models. Uh, the, everything we do just about, do I wear a raincoat today? Do I, do I allow the aircraft to take off? Uh, how much, you know, how much supply do I put in? All of these are conditioned on weather forecast models. Now in, in the field of atmospheric science, they always say there are three ways of forecasting the weather. You can use persistence. You can say that tomorrow's temperature at 11 o'clock it's going to be the same as today's temperature as 11 o'clock. And it turns out it's not a bad forecast. You can use climate as a forecast. Tomorrow's temperature at 11 o'clock will be the average of the last 40 
uh, what's this, October the 20th, temperature at 11 o'clock. And that's also a pretty darn good forecast. Or you could use some proxy. You know, the length of the hair on the caterpillars in my garden or the color of the leaves <laughs> or the output of some enormously complex computer model. Those three are exactly equivalent, some kind of proxy. It happens to be that the computer models are pretty darn good. And they're good in a surprisingly difficult thing if you think about it. You're trying to say what happens, rain, how much of it happens, what time it happens, and where in two, uh, two variables of space it happens, or if you're in British Columbia, three variables of space, rain or snow. This is a hugely complex task. And in fact, the, the current models we use and every forecast you, you consume today is the product of a numerical model run at, in Canada at the Canadian Meteorological Center in Dorval, um, or in Europe at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. These are huge computer models. Every relatively well-funded government in the world runs its own, and they're all pretty much the same, and they do exceptionally good work. What are these models? I really feel bound to point out these models are based on numerical solutions of equations, and the equations are so fundamental they cannot be questioned. They're not just things we dreamed up, the way economists dream up equations for inflation rate. These are implementations of Newton's laws, conservation of momentum, conservation of a mass, conservation of energy. These are indisputable quantities that are conserved, and that's all the models are based on. Unfortunately, so they're complicated, this, but that's this, what we uh, do every day. This gives an opportunity uh, to, to ask a question that's that's come from Graham in the audience, and 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 that is, could because you've raised it, and I think Dan has as well. Could you just distinguish between a model and a model run for the audience? What do you mean when you say that if you run the model, this is what happens, as opposed to what the model is? Could, uh, Dan could do it. I've spoken too much already, but I'm happy to pitch in on that one. Dan. I think it's all a question. That's a question of perspective sometimes. But, um, you know, as, as I would usually describe it, you, you have a, a set of laws that, you, well, things that you believe in. Right. So in Dow's case, it's Newton's laws, uh, you know, applied to the atmosphere. And in our case, it might be that, you know, people transmit a disease. One person could transmit a disease to another when they're in close contact. And over the whole population, we have some sense of the average rate of making these contacts. So, oh, sorry, I, I just messed myself up. But there should be some average rate of making contacts. Yeah. And distinguished from that, from the model, there's, there's the physical laws and there's the parameters. And the parameters are potentially arguable. Like I might say people make 2.75 close contacts per day on average, and somebody else might say 5.25 close contacts per day. Um, and so we could, we could run the model with different assumptions around inputs into the model and get different runs. And then we could compare them and see which one we like better, or which one fits the available data more reasonably. So I, I think that would be a simple distinction I would make. Yeah. Indeed. I, I, was, uh, I was thinking uh, about, sorry, Jim, I was going to ask, please go ahead. No, I was going to come. Uh, well, let's think now. So that's kind of related to it, Dan. But I was going to say, uh, though, that I like that last part of your comment because uh, I was reminded of that student you sent over to me, to, to uh, inviting me to join his uh, his research, his uh, thesis committee. He was a physical. Uh, he was trained as a physicist, and he and he was obviously uh, unhappy about coming over to talk to a statistician, and he had his arms folded like this. <laughs> He's sitting there glowering at me, and and so I asked him to explain what uh, what I, why he thought I was necessary on his committee. And without any hesitation, he said, "Well, he said, you know, physics is absolutely correct." He said, "And statistics is a lot of." And I'm not going to use a rude word here. It's the word BS. <laughs> I thought we we didn't get off to a really great start. Start, but I actually found him quite an interesting student. <laughs> uh, but anyway, you trained him well, though he was a real disciple of that uh, of that <laughs> particular <you>. mantra. <laughs> Jim, he was an extraordinarily difficult student, utterly brilliant, sharp-edged, 
and and difficult. <laughs> so you know, M Mark. Yeah. So this is interesting. There are many many models. Let us say weather forecast models in in each of the centers around the world. Each one is slightly different. They all use the same fundamental equations. Mm -hmm. Some of them use different mathematical techniques for solving the equations, mm -hmm. but that's simply a technical difference. Mm -hmm. All of these models have to have parameters in them that Dan spoke about. And, and the parameters in, in weather models uh, have to do with uh, processes that we do not understand fully, particularly like turbulence and, and the drag of wind on Earth's surface. These are all slightly different in each of the models. They're all based on research. They're all well well researched. They're all pretty well legitimate. So the models exist in their own, in a computer, as a set of code. The models also use, of course, the land surface, the height, where the trees are, where the snow is, where the earth is, a land sea mask, and so on. So those that input data are also part of the model. But nothing happens until you switch the model on. So where do we switch it on? Well, we have to start the model somewhere. So you take some data and you switch the model on and you let the model, and now there are tremendous technical difficulties about switching the model on, but let us pass over those. Um, you let the model run, that is a model run. The model then proceeds forward in time. Mm -hmm. It behaves as the weather, as if it were the weather, but virtually in a computer. And you could make a different run by starting it in a slightly different place, a different time, or with a different resolution to grid. Each of these could be independent model runs. And Graham is absolutely right. The, the, there tends to be a general confusion in the public about a model itself and the model run. Okay. Now, here's the really complicated thing. It turns out that what we have discovered in terms of doing weather forecasts is that if you take one model and you run it multiple times with slightly different starting points, and then you take effectively an average of the model, that performs better than any single implementation of the model. It's called ensemble modeling, ensemble forecasting, and that is now the common approach. In some ways, it's merely a technical trick. Uh, it's a bit of a mystery as to why it works. It is an intensely statistical task, which is why I sent my student to talk to Jim <laughs> to make sure that Jim was on his committee. We yeah, thanks, cannot thanks. make sensible progress without understanding the statistics of what so, we do. So, Jim, so, yeah, I hope uh, we comment on, on the difference between a statistical model and one that involves a physical constants as well as um, input data. Uh, yeah, sorry, you were asking me to comment on that? Yeah, or you, yeah. please. Yeah, um, no, I, I was gonna say uh, that Doe uh, is talking about, I think the butterfly effect. <laughs> and I didn't realize when we had a set of, of uh, meteorological models from the University of Washington, we were asked to figure out a statistical way of, of combining those by not simple averaging. I didn't realize they were actually the same model, but with different initial conditions yes. because of the butterfly effect. And we haven't talked about catastrophe theory as yet, mm -hmm. which was another big hit on uh, physical modeling in the middle of the last century. Uh, and uh, which actually taught us that there are sometimes uh, the possibility of catastrophic events occurring because of the nature of the models, such as the uh, Hadley cycle in the atmosphere disappearing or the uh, decadal oscillation from the Indian Ocean to nor Northern Atlantic. So, but uh, so I, I'd be interested to hear anyone's comment on that. I'm not sure that uh, how that would apply to the uh, to Dan's uh, context, but uh, it's certainly a fa feature of modeling. Well, perhaps it could arise due to the possibility of of the, the production of a new variant that that um, ah. escapes. escapes um, the immunity generated by the current vaccines, um, and that that could be that that could produce a sort of effect that you referred to um, in the climate modeling context. Dan, would you mm -hmm. would you want to comment on that? Because you make yeah. a certain assumptions in the epidemiologic model with regard to the infectivity of a particular variant or the 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 mm -hmm. active variant in the population. Correct. You could do that. I mean, so there there are. I'll, 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 there's another kind of modeling that hasn't really been touched on yet. Is is, you know, if I roll a dice, 
I can model that. I don't, that doesn't tell me what the answer is going to be, but I can, I can restrict the possible outputs to one through six, right? Or I can roll two dice and I can say, well, on average, it's going to be seven and there's going to be some distribution around this. And you can, you can have models which incorporate chance events and, and chance is somehow in the eye of the beholder, right? Because from, if you knew all the Newton's laws for the dice and the initial conditions, you could tell me which, which side it was going to land on. It would bounce off the table and land, right? But I can just say it's chance because I can't model that level of detail. It's basically impossible, right? Uh, but then you're asking, I think, a slightly different thing. And I don't uh, economists call this black swan, right? You mm -hmm. know, so, so we're, we're happily modeling the, you know, circulating coronavirus variant last year. And then, you know, it turned out retrospectively that starting in September in the UK, they had the, the, the alpha variant, or it's called the UK variant for a while, right? And, um, you know, that we, I think, you know, any evolutionary person, Sally Otto would have said, yeah, that we're going to see evolution to more transmissible strains. Yeah, that's fine. We all agree that probably will happen. But as the question as to when is that going to happen, ooh, ooh, that's a very tricky one, you know. And even if you think it's 95% likely to happen then within two months, you know, you, you, you still 5% of the time you're wrong, you know, or <laughs> it doesn't show up. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, indeed. We, we started off uh, on an interesting line. Uh, what is the model for? And my European colleagues, though not North American colleagues, European colleagues have developed this idea of fit for purpose. So before you start off in the model, you have to state what your purpose is. What am I trying to do with this model? If you don't, you'll build a model and will be drawn into the illusion that the model does everything. If you start off with the idea of fit for purpose, you have a very clear sense of what, what the end point is. And, and in my work, where we compare models with data in order to establish the veracity of the model, um, far too many of my colleagues set off on this task and you develop some statistical measure of agreement. One is perfect agreement. And so they get 0.5 and they say, oh, that's not good enough. Let's tweak it a little bit and you get 0.55. <laughs> and, oh, no, no, that's still not good enough. Let's really change the model. Oh, my goodness, we've got 0.7. Isn't that great? Um, and and I, I'm really critical of that approach uh, because I say you should have started off from the beginning saying, what am I going to do with the model output? And if 0.7 is good enough, 0.7 is good enough. If you can only get 0.65, throw your model away. <laughs> if you've got 0.8, it's redundant. And I've had a devil of a time trying to persuade my colleagues that this is what we should do. So much so that I shopped a manuscript around four journals discussing exactly this issue. And for one journal, oh, it's too philosophical. For another journal, oh, it's too technical. Eventually, I published it in some online instant publication place, and hardly anybody looks at it. I still think it's one of my most important papers, but mostly people ignore it. <laughs> your, your comments reminded me of this, uh, the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and that means keep make, it, make sure you understand the problem enough so that you don't try to make a model that's too complicated. And, uh, and von Neumann, you know, had that, uh, that comment that uh, if you give him four parameters, he can model an elephant. And if you give him five, he can make the trunk move. <laughs> yeah, and, I, now, I and nowadays, by the way, we're looking at models in the computer that have millions of parameters. So uh, <laughs> this principle doesn't apply there, I guess. Yeah. In, in, my the, field, there, the, there, in my field, there was something called over-parameterization of the model in the sense that you, you exceeded. And at some point, then what is the use? fullness of a model if you think you've become you you've encountered or accounted for virtually everything that you need to dan you looks like you have a comment to make yeah that's uh, that's a great point Mark. um so my colleague leah keshet is widely quoted um on on the following statement which is that if if if, if, if you're coming into a field and you're thinking about what can i do as a modeling person here if if you have lots of data high quality data and the field is pretty well understood you are unlikely to make a big contribution Right. On the other hand, if no one knows anything, 
<laughs> then, <laughs> then you can model if you want, but but you're not gonna. So there's kind of a sweet spot of of you know that we have partial information and we want to leverage that to to achieve some predictive power or or explain some phenomena that's been observed. And I think there's a lot of wisdom there, especially for students trying to find a project. You know, you, you don't want to model something where, where, where you don't know anything. You don't want to model something where people already think they understand everything, right? So, you know, you go back to Einstein on the train. He didn't come up with that out of a vacuum. Yeah. There, there had been a series of observations that didn't make any sense. And so there was partial information and then that create, you know, then the creativity comes in and, and, and then, you know, and then he's done, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so that's an opening for me to ask this question, which we haven't discussed um, in our uh, sort of pre-discussions. And that is, that is um, looking at forecasting or modeling with sparse data at the outset, and uh, and in, in the field I was involved in, using using a Bayesian sort of model is the one that has been used, and we all, whether we realize it or not, I think are being exposed to Bayesian models on a regular basis. So I wonder if there's a simple way, Jim, that you could explain the principle behind Bayesian models uh, using sparse data to get us started. Yeah, so that, that's a uh, that's a hugely important field nowadays, both in, in statistics as well as outside. Uh, and it was based originally on a sort of an a rationality foundation that goes way back, uh, I think, to uh, the 1800s when utility theory was first uh, established, um, and then later by von Neumann and Morgenstern in the 20s, who uh, began to realize that. Uh, there was not much point to giving error bands and things like that because what do you do with them? Ninety-five percent error bands. So they they came they came up with utility theory as as a way of trying to incorporate the the, the intended purpose of the model, and uh, so that's uh, carried over into what has become uh, nowadays the statistical uh, framework. Uh, although uh, people commonly now separate the probability side from the value side. Mm. And the value side is something we haven't talked about at all as so far, but it seems to me that's also an important part of this uh, Bayesian machine. So the Bayesian uh, part, set, uh, the probability part says that we tend, to, uh, we tend to place our bets based on our prior knowledge of things. And we can in fact assess a person's opinions by simple experiments involving coins to get there preliminary knowledge into the problem before, the, before they look at the data even. But we've kind of lost, uh, in statistics anyway, we've kind of lost utility theory, which was the part where you actually start looking at value, the values of things. And, uh, and, and so uh, that, that's something I, I kind of lament because instead of giving error bands, it actually asks you to make a decision based on things like ethical principles and other things that come into play. So that's an area that's been quite a lot neglected. But the basic idea behind Bayes uh, in his uh, famous work of the 1700s was that uh, we tend to behave as if we were being guided by some probabilities that are based on previous experience. And that was always seen as a subjective thing and therefore bad. But now it's begun to be realized, especially since sometimes the data isn't all that good, uh, that that uh, in, in background information cannot can be seen as valuable, and and, and instead of being thought of as a, as a prior prejudice or a prior bias, so um, yeah, so it's a, it's a, a certainly spread out and is used now in all sorts of different domains in mm -hmm. science, and uh, I mean the social sciences as well as the physical sciences and so on, yeah. Yeah. So, I, is, to Dan, do, do, uh, do you not use Bayesian analysis in, in getting your models to be aligned with the data? I use the word aligned carefully. Uh, ah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a big fan of Bayesian because uh, approaches because because they you know i'm thinking of specific examples but they allow you to include information that's difficult maybe to quantify so you can build prior opinion in you can say okay well i, I think this parameter is between 0.75 and one and not only do i think it but a bunch of people do and so then you build this prior information in um, but then we we use you know computational base to to fit 
various models of different complexity, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm usually pretty happy with it. I mean, I, I will throw one thing out there though. And I've, I've asked professional statisticians and others about this before, and I can see Cindy Greenwood at the top of the screen. And I've, I know, I know her opinion on this question, but um, it always strikes me when you're modeling and you're working with data that one of the biggest prior assumptions that you sort of do when you start to fit the model to the data is, is, is your model is a prior, you know, that's a very strong structure you're imposing down, you know, and you probably have great reasons for it. You know, Newton's laws are good reasons for that. Right. Um, but, but, you know, there are other laws in the world that aren't quite as strong as Newton's laws. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I put it to people before that models are a funny kind of prior. Um, I think Cindy doesn't think that's the right way to look at it, but uh, I think that's maybe there's maybe something that, yeah. No, I've been saying that for years. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so here's, I think this is another good segue. Um, Judith Hall asked an interesting question in, in, in saying that she's just, she just seen a, a news story on CBC in which a whole, a whole discussion of travelogue of, uh, of an experience in a town in Norway turns out to have been entirely fake. It's fake news. And of course, fake news has been in, in our news for too, too long a time now prior to and during the pandemic. But the question is, how do we know then if a model is going to be fed by fake news or fake data, things that are deliberately set up in an, in an inappropriate way by whoever provides the data, how will we know this? And how will we know when we can trust a model and when we ought not to trust a model? Do I, I can have a, a start of that. Um, you know, I, I mentioned uh, in passing and avoided the question of when you switch on an atmospheric model, um, and I just said, you switch it on, but there are complications. Well, let me explain the complications. The, the equations underlying an atmospheric model are conservation principles, and they, they all, those principles all uh, are internally consistent. The trouble with starting a model with real data is that the errors, the legitimate measurement errors in the data are not necessarily consistent with the equations. Hmm. So the startup position uh, of a model is in fact initially chaotic hmm. and you need a spin up period in which all the model variables come to in effect equilibrium with what the data tell you. So to Judith, uh, if the data were truly fake, it would probably be, probably be impossible to bring the data in line with the equations if it is something as complex as an atmospheric model. Um, it would be possible, I suppose, to create a fake set of atmospheric data, but they would have to be so complex and so carefully set up to be consistent with real data that one, one would question whether they are actually fake. So I, I don't think in atmospheric models, it's possible to use fake data uh, in a sense that fake data are totally erroneous and misleading. The model will tell you if they are misleading. Mm. And I, yeah. I assume, assume Jim or, or Dan, that a Bayesian model would do the same. If you have a set of fake data coming into any model, as long as you have a, um, a continuing accumulation of legitimate data, they should eventually swamp the, the fake data that would be coming in or the improper data. Would that be right? Yeah, I was just going to comment uh, along those lines that the, that the uh, posterior distribution that you get in a Bayesian analysis, as it's called, combines the opinion of the data with the opinion of the individual who's performing the analysis. Yeah. And so this, this takes and multiplies the two things together. And so, it's, and, and so the Bayesian uh, approach then would at least alert you if there was a big discrepancy and, and lead to f further inquiry. Um, I must say, although we're talking about modeling, I always thought that the data are probably where we should be spending a lot of our time in discussing and how sure. accurate it should be, ignoring the lies and the, the fake data. But even the data that are collected normally, we, we tend to take on faith and uh, analyze it. But, uh, but the data quality is a big issue. So I have, uh, a, I have, a, I have a lot of things I could, could add to this. Please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I mean, we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, when in, in many contexts, we spend probably, as, as Jim said, more time worrying about the method of generation of the data and whether this is actually, whether the data in itself is actually telling us what we want it to know, what we want to know for the model. Because there are quite often situations where the data is telling you something, but you realize it's kind of in this direction and you kind of want to know something going straight up and the data is sort of oblique, a little bit oblique to what you know. Um, but in terms, of, in terms of faking things, yeah. I, I mean, I've seen this. I have a colleague in Brazil who had been working on epidemiology of um, Zika, I think it was Zika. Um, I, uh, just a side comment on Brazil is I have a Brazilian student and every time she goes home, she comes back and, oh, I had Zika. Oh, I had Dengue. <laughs> it's almost, <laughs> it almost, almost gotten quite funny that she always has one of these sort of characteristic <laughs> tropical diseases when she's there. But anyway, um, but she, um, my friend, um, colleague in, in Brazil, you know, she had, she had, she was working on, um, I think it was Zika and suddenly the data was looking weird. And it wasn't, it wasn't in agreement with the sort of seasonal, seasonality of the disease. And guess what? That was when the Olympics was going to happen. And yeah, the, you know, they'd intent, people were in, the, the authorities were intentionally suppressing right. disease right. information. And, you know, so you could say, oh, yeah, models are great because models let you identify that kind of thing. Um, and, and it did in that case. But, um, you know, if you're dealing with an intelligent bad actor who's intentionally trying to fake you out, then then well, you've just got to be more intelligent, right? Uh, but that applies to everything. So I, have an, I have another comment to Judith. I, I too heard the interview with the Norwegian photographer. Fascinating. <laughs> um, but I must point out that the fake scenes he's generating are generated in order to fool people. The fake scenes are so close to reality that it that it that is hard to detect that they are fakes, which is the whole point of his art. Um, and in 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 a similar way, the, the fake data that that look so close to real data um, that they fool a model are probably very close to real data and probably not completely misleading. And it's a it's a hugely slippery slope, though. And of course, as as Dan points out, you know, there will be instances where there are fake data that, that are totally misleading and they might slip by a model. But it, it's hard to conceive of how that might happen. Hey guys, so I think um, this gets us close to what, you know, you might think of as the elephant in the room. And, 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 and that is, <laughs> that is the, pub, the public trust in the output and interpretation of models. One of the things we, we've been hearing from, particularly from south of the border is, just trust the science, just trust the science, which I really don't like at all because it's science doesn't tell us anything. Science is a method for getting evidence and gathering it. And then people have to interpret this evidence. And there's uncertainty as Jim has said quite, quite well in, in, in almost everything that we see. So the, the question is who, who do we trust when the model output tells us something, who do we trust to indicate to us what the model is telling us and what we ought to think about doing in terms of our behavior in relation to what we think the model is telling us. Any comments on that? So I can, I'd like to start off by one specific example that's, that's very close to me, and that, of course, is climate modeling. And people will say, well, come on, you can't forecast the weather for better than four days out. <laughs> uh, why do you expect me to believe a climate model that you're extending for 100 years out? And, and the, the answer is actually quite difficult. And, and subtle, but, but here is the real answer. The, the weather forecasts, uh, their veracity decays quite quickly. Uh, you know, in, in the weather we're having in Vancouver at the moment with the, the frequent passage of fairly weak uh, weather systems, um, th there's very little reliability in much more than 48 hours. Um, and the reason for that is that there is a degree of uncertainty in the behavior of the atmosphere, and it diverges from the model because of unresolved small scale meteorological effects. Okay. When you build a climate model, you simply average over all of those. The climate model is not intended to tell you, is it gonna rain on Thursday, the 4th of December, 2050? The climate model is intended to tell you what the global temperature is gonna be um, averaged 
over a band of, of latitude, uh, over a period of decades, uh, many decades in the future. Now we are building regional climate models that are designed to show spatially resolved features, but nevertheless, that we model, we, we average the, the equations over space and time in order to suppress the short term variability that makes weather forecast eventually uh, have limited predictability. This doesn't mean to say climate models are totally predictable over decades or tens of decades or even hundreds of, of decades. But in fact, the climate models, uh, their intent, and this is the idea of fit for purpose, their intent is to model the longer term, larger scale features of global climate. Um, average possibly over seasons rather than uh, at a time scale of hours. So that's a big problem that the public have in accepting climate models is that they, they think they are exactly the same as weather forecast models, even though they're based on exactly the same equations. There are profound differences in terms of averaging. Jim. No, I was going to say, though, that, uh, um, you know, people uh, are, are using these, I mean, serious people are using these models uh, by downscaling them. And so I was involved in a project on uh, agricultural, uh, estimating agricultural uh, produce uh, under global, global climate change models. And these were being downscaled uh, to the sort of, to a year or two. And, and the numbers that were coming out of these models under various scenarios about emissions in the future were now being used to predict crop yields in the future. Uh, and these weren't uh, th these these weren't uh, crooks uh, or somebody <laughs> deliberately trying to deceive people. They were actually honest people who were, and they're no, still that, doing that, by the way. Th that's absolutely correct, Jim. So what what is done then is the climate model is run out into the future, say the next century, and then you want to say, okay, so what is the spatial expression of this changed climate at a scale that affects? agriculture or urbanization or transportation, you then downscale, and that's exactly the term, you downscale from the spatially averaged, temporally averaged climate model down to a smaller local scale, and maybe in time down to a seasonal scale for agricultural purposes particularly. How do you do the downscaling? Ah, well, you can use many techniques for doing the downscaling. One of them is to simply take the current spatial structure of say temperature and rainfall from measured data and, and impose that structure on the climate model output and say, okay, there's, there's the variability in space. That's why this place would not be good as a farm and that one will. Or you in fact use a, 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 as a next step, a fine scale model, much like the weather forecast models and you embed the structure of the weather forecast model in what the climate model tells you the climate will be in a hundred years time. And no, it's not simple. It's not simple technically, and it's not simple conceptually, but it in fact is a very real thing. Apparently people are buying, uh, buying land up around Prince Rupert because it's going <laughs> to become possible to make wine up there uh, <laughs> based on these kinds of uh, analyses you're describing. Yeah, you know, and what I, what I keep saying is fine, but <laughs> in order to grow grapes, you need a particular soil profile and soil profiles typically take a few hundred years to develop, 200 <laughs> or 300. So don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so the, the, the time, time scale of the model is really important. For in, in, in the case of climate, people are looking forward decades to, to, to hundreds of years. Um, in the case of an epidemic, we're looking forward to weeks, months, and maybe a year or two. Um, and I, I guess uh, for the public to believe that the models are telling us something reasonable with regard to the progress of an epidemic, Dan, what are the things... <laughs> Assuming a consistency in, in a circulating variant uh, or um, of a particular um, microbe or virus, what can affect the impact of the model or the predictability of the model over a period of weeks, months, or a year or two? Um, in, in, is there anything that can do so analogous to what Doe said with regard to, to small-scale uh, atmospheric 
phenomena that we don't have measurements for or information about that can that can move a model in one direction or another. I mean, I, you know, in terms of predicting what's actually going to happen, you would first of all need to model politicians. <laughs> I think we'll we'll agree for the current conversation that that's impossible, right? <laughs> you know, so so. Um, you know, when Alberta, when Alberta reopened, right, the, the guy at UVic, Dean Carlin, who I mentioned before with his nice predictive model of, of, of epidemics, he, he said, well, if I adjust this parameter, <laughs> the transmission parameter, yeah. to what I think it probably roughly is, and it didn't have to be very precise, then, whoop, you know, you would see a lot of cases, right? Um, but, but then he, you know, he has to put an asterisk somewhere on here because they're not going to allow that that level of disease to continue right at some point they would you know there's no way it's going to go you know you're not going to have tens of thousands of people in hospital there's just no way for them to go right um and they're not going to have let people just die at home so they will change eventually and, and it's true they did eventually they you know jason kenny came back from his vacation and they you know they, they turned turned it around but you know th then there's then there's other other questions that if, you, if you'll permit me. So there's a lot of interest right now in what does endemic COVID look like, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and that I think is, is more akin to a climate model, if, mm. if, if you like, though, um, that, that, you know, we can put in some, some assumptions about, you know, rate of waning of immunity, uh, either post-vaccination or post-infection. Um, or both. What that, what that rate of waning of immunity is, if it's a year, if it's five years, what does that mean? I mean, do you just get infected and you have a cold? Do you, do you have a risk of, of getting seriously ill? Um, and then you, you can draw conclusions from that. And, you know, even then, I, I wonder if we'll be right. But, but in some ways, it's a framework of thinking about what's coming uh, in, in the future, right? Hmm. But included in an endemic case, I would presume that because we're looking at outcomes in terms of impact on people's health and you need to model the demographics of the population to be infected, affected over time, correct? The comorbidity rates and the age distribution and so on. Yes, I, I agree. But I mean, that I would say, let, let, I think there's a lot to be said for getting the big picture right first and then, and then zooming in. One of the big challenges with, with this COVID epidemic has been the extreme nonlinearity in effects, you know, if, if you're over 80, this is a very serious health risk. If you're under 20, it's a very minor health risk, you know, and so and the rest of us are somewhere in between, but it really looks, it's really looks like this, the, the level of risk if you're infected. And it's been, been tough to build that in to, to understand then and then also human contact patterns and in particular, perturbed human contact patterns when we're all afraid, right? Um, yeah. One of the thought experiments that I did earlier on was, was to say, how would our, our, our politicians as well as people in society in general have behaved had things been in the inverse, that the people most at risk were under the age of 15 and the people who were relatively not at risk were all those over the age of 60. I think behaviors would have been very different than they, than they have been. Um, um, uh, Jim, please. If I may add add to this, uh, the one thing we really haven't touched on, I think, is is the uh, is risk assessment as, as a formal exercise. Yeah. And in doing a risk assessment, for example, if you're building a nuclear power generator or you're building a, a highway bridge, you have to make certain assumptions, and uh, one of those involves safety. About is about safety. And so uh, nuclear power stations are built uh, with a so-called 100-year return period, meaning there's one chance in a 1,000 that in a given year it will fail. The highway bridge, it's one over 100. And, uh, and so uh, what, this, what this means is that we are accepting that some people will be, uh, will, will, will be possibly uh, hurt or possibly die as a result of a failure. And we actually have to, we do implicitly assign uh, uh, dollar values to these mm -hmm. kinds of things. And, and so the, all that modeling is done when you're building a, a bridge or a nuclear power generator is implicitly putting a value on life. And the, the question, and, and if you look at, and by the way, if you look it up in Google, you can find out that in Canada, we put less value on a human life than we do, than people do in the United States. And so uh, that's, that's not an aspect of modeling, I guess, that we normally think about, but uh, 
it's implicit in some of those calculations that are made. And, uh, and so a number of life years is an issue and uh, that sort of thing in terms of policy and management. And, and the modeling is helpful in, in that regard. So, so Jim, how much do you account for the fact that it seems to me, if I've got the, the information correct, that probably the safest of all the means of generating energy is nuclear power, and yet people are much more afraid of that than they mm. are of the other methods, uh, which have much greater impact on our health than has to date than has nuclear energy. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, no, it's uh, no, no, I've wondered that myself. It's <laughs> yeah, it's not a rational world. That's uh, that's for sure. Although we often assume it is. There, 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 are, there are two parts to risk, though, that I think modeling addresses sort of directly. And I always think it's you should break up risk into two things. There's the risk that the thing that you're worried about is going to happen, and then there's the estimate of how bad it's going to be if it happens. And I think nuclear power does well on the first one and poorly on the second one, in a sense, right? Um, and I think that's the way you should think about, <laughs> about these, these, these low probability events is, is also how mm. bad is it going to be if it does happen, right? Well, it's, it's interesting. Because it, and I, I guess you're, you're thinking in terms of a meltdown, right? In, in the sense that from historically, bad things have happened, but actually the, the impact on human health and, and mor mortality rates has been very small compared to compared to coal and oil and even natural gas. So, so, so yeah, I think that's true. I think in, 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 the, in the context of research ethics involving, you know, involving humans, we have to think about the probability of adverse effects, but then and again, the probability and the nature of the most serious among adverse effects to determine yeah, at what point you, you begin to say, well, should this be done? Ought this to be done in this way? Yeah. Uh, Jim, don't you statisticians have the term the expectation value, which is the product of the cost times the probability? And how, yeah. how do we handle that? Yeah, no, that's so that goes back to von Neumann and Morgenstern in the 20s when they uh, were trying to uh, give uh, some uh, technical meaning to Jeremy Bentham's original utility. philosophical theory of utility. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they were they discovered that we all have values that could be uh, given numericals, can be, can be given a numerical value. And so uh, that kind of thing is should be uh, in, a, in a proper analysis, including a statistical analysis should be take, taken into consideration. And Jeremy Bentham was arguing that the, the right policy decision should maximize, the, the, should, be, should give the greatest benefit to the greatest number of people while recognizing that you can't necessarily protect everybody. So uh, there's the trade-off there that's implicit in a lot of the planning that's done, but, uh, but it's, it's a not an easy discussion uh, to, uh, to have uh, when you get down to the individual level. But a uh, very interesting part of modeling. Right. So, um... So um, Judith Hall has asked another question in relation to, to when, when designing a model, it's probably particularly important in healthcare, um, but probably elsewhere as well. And designing a model, how much care has to be given to the possibility of confounders if you're looking for factors that, ah. that are, might be causal or that might in fact appear to be, but are not actually causal because they're correlated with causal factors. How much thought needs to be given to confounders in designing a model? Surely Dan can deal with that night better than I can. Yeah. Jim, let, 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 let Dan answer that question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so your passing is that it, Jim? <laughs> I can I can tell you that on the ground, we don't we, we do we do think about confounders, but I think we tend to get things going first and then think carefully after. At least that's my my take. I don't have a structured approach to uh, yeah. to model development, but in terms of ethical issues, yeah, I mean. Fortunately, if you're working in biochemistry, usually you're fairly well insulated from the ethical side. But yeah, there is uh, there's a lot to think about. You know, I, I don't think of modeling as being divorced from any other aspect of science. I think it's just an intrinsic part of what I do. And uh, um, yeah, uh, well, if, if, I was in my, if I was in my home office, I would point to the to the certificate <laughs> on the wall that says I took ethics training, and then I would say, <laughs> so we're completely fine at this point. You know? I, I, uh, I agree uh, entirely uh, with Dan. You know, atmospheric uh, scientists build models uh, and and let someone else use them and then deal with the consequences thereafter. Um, 
Confounders are not really an issue in atmospheric modeling. Um, we, we understand the fundamentals of science so thoroughly, I think, that it's, they're unlikely to be fundamental confounders. Oh. Possible confounders can be a coincidence of two well-understood uh, events that might occur together. Um, and, and for those of you who sailors, Richard Spencer, you will recall the disaster of the uh, Sydney Hobart race. Well, that was a confounding, a two particular weather features that coincided in the Bass Strait and produced winds of enormous intensity. Um, and no, I don't think the models captured that one well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so if I may just add uh, that I was, I served on an, uh, an environmental protection agency committee uh, on, on setting ozone standards in the United States. Mm. And I raised the question uh, that has that has now come up about confounders because I said, well, listen, you know, we're looking only at ozone, but it's correlated with uh, other other species like nitric oxide and so on. And uh, I was sort of ruled out of order by the chair of this 22 person committee of experts saying uh, that in the Clean Air Act of 1970, we're not allowed to consider more than one pollutant at a time. <laughs> so, of course, when they get to the NO, setting the standards for uh, for nitrous oxide, then they're going to have to go through the same thing. And somebody might say, well, that's correlated to the ozone. Uh, so that that is a hugely important question. And it's now a big part. And so Judy's asked a really great question. Uh, it's a big part of my subject now. And there's a whole subfield of, of people thinking about the question of causality. And there are some subtle things like, for example, if you have one variable that is the real cause of something like a health incident, but, but it's poorly measured, and then you have something that's correlated with it that's totally irrelevant, but really, really well measured, what will happen in a statistical analysis is that the cause will be transferred to, yeah. to the fake uh, 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 member of the of the of the. Uh, predictors, which isn't the cause at all, but just because it wasn't so well measured. So it comes back to the quality of data, which is another big issue we haven't really talked about a lot today. But, I see Uri has an interesting question, which I would like to deal with. Yeah, great. Do you, it's, it's almost a statement that can be, can be turned into a question, though. Why I was going to do it, but why don't you go ahead? So, so it's very interesting, Uri. You say neural nets. Uh, are an example of producing a different model that would predict simulation results. Well, well, my colleague, Adam Monaghan, who has a UBC PhD, is now, uh, I think, at the University of Kiel. He uses neural net models to model simply the output of very complex climate models. So he's built a model of a model. <laughs> the reason for doing that is that the neural net model is much easier to operate and can be used to explore climate futures. So, yes, it is a model layered upon a model. And absolutely, the neural net gives you enormous flexibility. It's a flexibility that bothers me a bit because it can model any darn thing you like. But we're not sure why it does so, so well. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there's something I'd like to add if I get it. But I see Dan has has uh, has his hand up. So Dan, why don't you go ahead? And... Okay, Jim. Yeah, I was pretty excited when Yuri wrote this. I, uh, hi, Yuri. It's good to see you. Well, not, um, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, let me let me tell you a very quick story. So I was at a conference, and this guy called Gary Myrams from Nottingham University. He studies. He studies ion channels in the brain, and uh, in particular, these sort of experimental systems for ion channels in the, in the brain. And he came into possession of extraordinarily good data. Just, just, just think of whatever topic you want, and just imagine you had amazing data at incredible high time and spatial resolutions and whatever. So then he went back to the literature, and he found that the ion channel he was, that the data was for was... Um, there were sort of 20 or 25 models in the literature which were related to that um, ion channel. And so then he proceeded to fit every model. And he, he was sort of hoping that one of them would be the winner. <laughs> and of course that didn't, and these, these models are not just made up. They're not, they're not neural nets. They're not, they, they, they have 
all have physics built into them, you know, along the way. So this isn't just some 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 arbitrary exercise. And a few of them he got to throw away. So his good data, he got to throw away, you know, five or ten of the older ones, and they were probably kind of broken in known ways already. But then, you know, so so what's he supposed to do? He has ten models with different physical features. The usual answer of well, go get some more data, and that will help distinguish, is not really available to him because he already has as much data as you could possibly want. Um, so I, I think you're making a very good point that. If you have a set of data, then the models that that data will support are not necessarily uh, dis disjoint conceptually. Um, and mm -hmm. so what he really needs, I think, is experimental models of a completely experimental data of a completely different kind that allows him to come in from an orthogonal direction and pull things apart. Oh, yeah. the other thing I wanted to say was maybe you missed this, Yuri, but in the beginning, I made a comment about the aesthetics of modeling. And for me, and I explicitly said, I don't think neural nets m meet my aesthetic uh, qualities. Of, um, <laughs> of, so I want to I have something nice to look at as well as something to look at. If I may add a slightly different uh, uh, response. Um, uh, th this is about a, an article that appeared uh, in the last uh, few months in Wired magazine about an experiment that was done where the, the deep learning model was actually learning the difference between a chimpanzee in a photograph and, a, and an orangutan. And so, of course, a three-year-old three child could, after seeing three or four of these things, would actually be able to tell you the difference, right? But this, mach this machine was given uh, tens of thousands of pictures of, of chimpanzees and, and uh, these orangutans. And uh, so it, it eventually was able to uh, learn the difference, uh, and it was accurate to about 71% of the time. And the, the researchers were, were really chuffed that they'd done so, so well. Uh, but, the exper but that's not the experiment. The experiment was that they then photoshopped out these, uh, these animals, and they got the same pictures again, absolutely the same pictures. And the computer went through, and it correctly identified the chimpanzees and the orangutans, even though they didn't appear in the picture anymore. Well, of course, the problem is that they didn't know what the computer had learned. And what the computer learned was what these things like to eat or what they like to be in and so on. And it wasn't the animals at all it was recognizing. So you, you, you can't be sure, you can't really trust these things, uh, you know, unless you've got a rationale to explain what they discovered. Uh, it can be pretty dangerous, I expect. I see we have 10 minutes to go, and I, I'm, I'm really reluctant to do this, but I feel I must point out that all of us have been discussing numerical models. Ah. And that science progresses in many other ways. Remember, when, when Mendel studied his little peas, um, he was studying peas, but we all use his results as a model for genetic transmission of anything. Much of our understanding of genetics, Judith will tell us this, uh, is that they use a Mediterranean fruit fly as a model for genetics. It's over and over, it's an organismal model. Um, there's um, a little worm, C. elegans, that is used by geneticists as a model. Um, in my field, uh, we use wind tunnels to study if model effects on buildings. These are scale models. Um, ship designers use towing tanks to design the best ships. These are models of ships. So that models in science come in many different forms, not just the numerical models that us three mathematical geeks have been discussing. My colleague Susan Allen has a model ocean in the EOS basement. It is a rotating table, which she uses to study the propagation of uh, deep ocean water up uh, ocean canyons off the continental shelf. This too is a model. It is actually a physical scale model. So I just wanted to broaden the discussion to, to, to point out the use of models is quite wide, wider than we've been discussing here. Well, wasn't that Mendel data fake? <laughs> didn't, he, didn't, he have, didn't he have this dedicated uh, servant who, uh, who knew what he was trying to prove and so that, gave him that, fake data? 
that's the story, Jim. I think that came, it arose from the fact that when someone, some years after, quite a few years after Mendel's data were published, did a, a post hoc statistical analysis and found the p-value for the results that he got to be so exceedingly low that it was highly improbable that he could have got data that good. Oh. So I think the assumption was made that 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 one or more of the gardeners who worked for him actually knew what he was looking for. And if they happened to step on a pea plant that was too small, well, they just didn't count it. You know? <laughs> ah, okay. I, though I'm glad you raised the comment you did because I used to talk to my students and saying, for, for those of the, the graduate students who've never read the double helix, it's worth, it's worth a read because, because one of the most profound models that were built to give us our current model of, of the structure of DNA and the way it works was based upon, you know, um, basically a stick and wire model put together by Watson and Crick who knew very little about, of, about organic chemistry and about, uh, about uh, these kinds of models without the data inputs that they got from the chemists and the, and the X-ray uh, diffraction studies that they stole from, from Rosalind Franklin. But using very simple stuff that we have around the house, they put together a model that turns out to be pretty close likely to, to the structure of DNA, which is yeah, incredible. Absolutely. Wow. So, so really, and one should then also recognize that preceding all of these models, the numerical models, the physical structural models, um, lies a conceptual model that exists in the mind of the modeler. We develop a conceptual model of how things work, and we then translate that conceptual model into something that we can use, a set of equations, a numerical model, a uh, P's, on, P's in a plot, um, a, a towing tank, and so on. So that the, it is ultimately the, the conceptual intellectual model that exists in the scientist's mind that precedes all of these, all of these models. And that brings me to this fascinating thing about beam physicists who live in the macroscopic world in which they can ride their bicycle and know where they are. <laughs> and yet when they're dealing with just with, with the subnuclear particles moving close to the speed of light, everything is different. It does not behave like a bicycle in the real world. And these, these people are amazing because they can switch their conceptual model into the relativistic world. And then when they ride their bicycle back into the macroscopic world, and I think that's quite amazing. <laughs> Until you yeah. enter the quantum world, in which case nobody understands or has a good conceptual model uh, that, that could explain it. But, but nonetheless, or, or if they there. claim to understand that they haven't. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So uh, David, David Tate has an interesting uh, comment about social, social reality and models. You know, uh, it is very important to look at the name given to the various climate modeling scenarios. Um, oh gosh, I've forgotten the acronym, but effectively it is a possible potential trajectory. Oh. <laughs> it's not even a scenario. <laughs> and it, it is a possible potential possible. trajectory based on a set of assumptions about carbon dioxide emissions or about greenhouse gas emissions in total. And, and the point of, of naming it so carefully is that we do not know what the social reality is going to be. We do not know how we might achieve any one of those, those emissions patterns, and nor do we know how society will react if that turns out to be the particular trajectory. So there's a, a very careful, and, and David calls it a, a dance between social systems and models. Indeed, and it's a very complicated dance. And, mm -hmm. and I quake before the possibility of trying to model social behavior. I leave that to the <laughs> psychologists, uh, which I find the most difficult subject of all. <laughs> well, thanks yeah. for that. I, I was trying to make a question out of David's comment, and I'm still not sure exactly what the intention is, of course, but uh, our social systems and social models of social systems get the, the, the social reality that we experience gets entangled with our models and are not. I'm not quite sure what that means, but if you guys have an, a thought about that, please go ahead. No, it's a difficult one. The difficult one, yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, we, you know, human beings have experimented, experimented with um, different political systems, right? And, and clearly, 
you know, you can look at it simply and say, well, there's a lot of propaganda in favor of the political system that you live in. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but, but, but that's that's not the that that political system came into being because somebody had a model of how a political system could operate that they thought had some good features, right? And so, uh, yeah. yeah. But Dan, the the, the parameters in a component uh, in a, a um, component model of an epidemic, each one of those contains social behavior, do they not? Yeah. yeah. Look, it's not impossible to to to, to model social things. Um, mm -hmm. When I was a postdoc, I ran into these people who are trying to model, um, you know, um, uh, economic history, I, I think I would say, you know, um, and they were serious, you know, some, somewhere in that space between economics and um, um, political science, I would say. And, and they were seriously trying to parameterize you know, 17th and 18th century European states is what I remember, you know. Um, I, ne I never figured out where they got to. Maybe somebody else on the call knows knows where they got to with that. But I think I think it's it's worthwhile. I mean, and it does remind me of climate modeling a bit. I mean, one of the issues, right, is weather modeling. You have to sort of understand individuals, right, or individual places. You know, the weather the weather in individual places. You know, for for a mean field model, you know, an averaged model of politics. You know, you get averaging is very powerful, right? If you don't have to worry about the individual fluctuations, then then averaging is, is immensely powerful. And we exploit that in epidemic modeling a lot. But that's also why some people don't like it is because, OK, I can I can stand up and I did this and say lots of people at UBC are vaccinated. We're all going to wear masks. I don't think there's going to be a big outbreak, but I think there's going to be some cases and that's all fine until you're one of those cases. And then you've got a problem and you're not happy about that. Right. So it is. And now, we're, and now we're back. We've gone all the way around again to the Mark's question from half an hour ago. And back to that question. Thanks for that. Um, Dan, back to that question about causality, because ultimately we're interested in causes of things, particularly if we want to if we want to um, intervene to make a change in the outcome in the future. And and it, it, it touches on the problem of climate modeling and the fact that we perceive carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere as to be causal for the changes that we observe with, with climate. And we face the fact that a substantial proportion of society either appears to, to disagree with the causal claims of the models uh, uh, or doesn't believe them. And uh, despite the, the, the best intentions of, of scientists to do, who do the modeling and try to explain it to the public. And so we're, we're down to, and back to the question of, of A, how do, how do we arrive at decisions about causality in, in such models? And, and when, when the public chooses to ignore them, if it has, has to do with, with retrodiction or prediction of, of political and, and psychological impacts on outcomes in society, that's one thing. But if, it, if it's a prediction of the future on an intervention that we're in the process of generating now and we could correct this, but people don't believe it or won't act upon it, that's a critically important question, right? And how do we, A, get determine and, and, and whether or not the public actually believes the the, the impacts of the model and the causal factors in the model. And if they do, how do we begin to encourage them to, to make the kind of changes that are necessary to, to alter the future? Yeah. Okay, so it's not an easy question. <laughs> no, that's, that's, a, that's a hugely difficult question. I mean, the, the, when, observ when, when scientists were forced to use observational studies because they couldn't use properly randomized experiments in the lab yeah. uh, with everything controlled, then of course, that's what led to a lot of the statistical stuff yeah. where you had regression models. And the hope was that you were gonna include all the variables that could possibly be the cause. But of course, you never know if there isn't one other one that's lurking out there that's the real answer and isn't going to be caught in the model. But uh, but some of these designs, experimental designs, like controlled, uh, the controlled clinical trials exper uh, experiments are at least an attempt to try and address that issue uh, in an ethical way without forcing people, you know, to, uh, to take one or the other of the two treatments. But, uh, but, but they, they do that as well as we possibly understand how it could be done. But there's some questions that simply cannot be answered in that way. We can't, we can't determine the impacts of tobacco on people's health in a randomized controlled trial. We can't determine the effect of, of adding more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere on the climate, which is an end of one experiment that we're engaged in right now. Um, 
so so yeah we, we need in the case, in the case of ozone uh, uh students were forced to go in a lab where they had actually changed the ozone concentrations while they jogged and walked and so on right. of course they were paid to do this but <laughs> i don't know how much choice they actually had so they managed to make a controlled experiment at reasonably yeah. low dosage but that still doesn't take care of the of the issue you're raising but it does take care of one part of the problem and that is the reduced lung function that you get uh with these uh, pollutants like ozone yeah Indeed. And, and, and much of our decision making has to be based upon observational data and modeling those data for future outcomes and, and ascribing causality somewhere so that we can think about intervening. And, and it seems that segments of the public, if, if scientists cannot say to them, it's absolutely proven that this is the case, there is no possibility of doubt, and we can demonstrate this in the mm. following way. Absent that, it's hard to generate the political will and the economic will to, to make the changes. Mm. And the fact is, that's never going to come. I mean, we're never going to be able to say with that degree of certainty for most of these kinds of phenomena that that's the case. So, mm. yeah. Do, looks like you were going to make a comment there too, Joe. <laughs> oh, actually, I just realized I'm supposed to keep track of the time and we're pretty much out of time. Yeah, we are indeed. So I'd like to thank you guys for a most interesting discussion and for our audience and their participation uh, for the questions and hopefully for, for some enjoyment of the discussion that we've had. Um, and if you have any thoughts or suggestions that you can send into the college afterwards, please feel free to do so. Um, and I think, I think, Christine is going to put up a slide that will remind me to remind you to check online to, to um, there it is, to look at the upcoming events starting this Friday and carrying on through mid-November. Uh, please check online. And once again, thanks for your participation. And again, any, any thoughts or comments that you have that can help in future for, for, uh, for similar types of, of conversations, uh, please do let us know. Thank you very much, everyone.